our life uh, from Elaine F. Elaine served as folklorist for the city of Baltimore and the state of Maryland at the Maryland Historical Trust and State Arts Council. She chronicles living traditions and has earned national awards for her work in oral history, film, and traditional arts. Her work on Baltimore's unique folk art culminates in the book, The Painted Screens of Baltimore, uh, called the single greatest book about Baltimore in 50 years. She's co-founder of the Painted Screen Society of Baltimore. Please welcome Elena. First of all, there's not a single F word except my name in my book. <laughs> so, I don't want to disappoint anybody. Um, I am not a reader, I'm a talker. However, I'm going to read to you. Um, and then I will talk to you. Um, so, this is my book. This is my first book. This is my only book. And it has been an incredible journey, which is what I'm going to read to you about, and then we'll talk a bit, if that's okay. For most of the 20th century, vivid paintings have adorned window and door screens in Baltimore's row house neighborhoods. In no other place would a walk down any random street cause passers-by to wonder how they had stumbled into an outdoor art gallery. Only in Baltimore is an enticement to enjoy bright landscapes on woven wire window screens simultaneously an invitation and an act of exclusion. The beloved homegrown art form known as painted screens was a 20th century commonplace found only in this one American city. Painted screens are a gift to the streets. The art is free for the taking, but the show stops there. From inside, the screen is unadorned, the view to the street unobstructed. From the outside, all that's visible is the artwork. The privacy of row house denizens is guarded by the artist's handiwork. Painted screens are one community's way of saying, enjoy the view, but keep moving. While Baltimore has been the sole preserve of this folk art expression in recent history, a kindred decorative art enjoyed popularity beginning two centuries earlier in London. Both traditions are rooted in the availability of wire and woven cloth, artists' inclination to embellish any surface, and the need for privacy among homeowners and businesses. The early art form found favor in England, Europe, and Victorian America, then seemed to vanish, only to be invented anew by William Octavec, a grocer in Baltimore, Baltimore's little Bohemian neighborhood, who claimed to be unaware of any precedent. Little Bohemia, for those who don't know, is now the neighborhood called, soon to be renamed Eager Place um, at uh, Collington and Ashland Avenues and North, the 88 acres that um, were banished and are being rebuilt. I'm moving ahead. Painted screens are my rosebud. I liter literally stumbled over them enough times that I could not help but submit to them. I never imagined I might stake my career on learning their story and sharing it with a larger audience. My journey began when I left for graduate school, detouring from a career in law to study folk art in Cooperstown, New York. As the door to the Volkswagen van containing all my worldly possessions slid shut in a suburban Baltimore driveway, my mother queried, folk art, is that like the painted screens of Baltimore? I shrugged my shoulders, climbed behind the wheel and headed north. Hours later, I was enjoying a welcome beverage in the parlor of Louis Jones, the gentleman scholar who would become my mentor in folk art. He registered delight that a Baltimorean was sitting before him one who might finally address his questions about the city's famed painted screens. Barely three weeks later, I was toiling in the basement art storage collections of the New York State Historical Association. My job was to separate paintings from their frames, the curatorial vogue at the time. I spied a pair of misplaced artifacts. What were aged, wood-framed window screens doing among the artworks? As I tilted the surface to catch the light, I noticed faded monochromatic landscape scenes on the finely woven mesh. The catalog card revealed that I had unearthed two late 19th century landscape screens from nearby Fort Plain, New York. No artist, no provenance. Spinning origin theories in my head, same form, earlier time, different place, I hopped into my less than trusty VW van and headed back down the highway straight to Northeast Baltimore and the Octavec Art Shop established 1922. This was in the autumn of 1974, the first of many miles in a journey that would bring people, place, and tradition in closer focus through a single creative object native to my hometown. 
The research for this book was indeed more than half the fun. Meeting the screen painters one by one was like peeling and savoring the history embedded in the layers of wallpaper, paint, and paneling in a city row house, each one more vividly patterned and unanticipated than the next. And around every corner, I found an outdoor museum whose creator or curator lived just behind each storefront gallery. So that is in response to the question that I get most, ask most often is like, why, how did you get involved in painted screens? And it is true that we are indeed the only city um, in the world um, that today and in 20th century America has ever sustained this art form. Um, today, we have a little bit of a different story. Um, this book, 256 pages, 300 photographs, um, is kind of a, a, an act of love. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, backwards even. My, oh, this is my yeah. Vanna White joke. Thank you. <laughs> um, actually, this is kind of an opportunity to show you how things have changed. When I started uh, 40 years ago on this un, you know, unexpected, um, lifelong um, search, um, a painted screen, would you like to take this around to show to people, perhaps? <laughs> Was a little red bungalow, this precious work of art. Is that Judy? Oh my god. I haven't seen this woman in 25 years since we felt since we, we ran into each other at playing vo volleyball on the beach in, in Santa Monica. <laughs> Total coincidence, since we were girlhood friends. Oh my lord. Um, anyway, <laughs> small to more. Um, anyway, this was what a, uh, anybody who knows me knows that I am not like a red bungalow girl. But the red bungalow was, in fact, kind of the trademark. If you walk through the city street, the streets of Baltimore, and you said painted screen, you were talking about this. You were talking about William Octavec's little red bungalow with a winding path and swans in a pond. Mm -hmm. A beauty. Taken right off of a greeting card, taken right off of a calendar. Oop, sorry. Um, cute. Precious. Not my style. But I persevered, and I persevered because when I started my, my, you know, my search, I came here first. You know, went to the Octavex, met the likes of a uh, number of Octavex, met Johnny Eck, um, kind of the, the uh, really famed sideshow character, half man, coincidentally a screen painter, coincidentally a neighbor of the Octavex and a student of the Octavex. Having, coming on his little, either on his arms, working his way around the corner, um, or on one of, I, Johnny Eck invented the skateboard, you heard it here. Um, in 19, he was born in 1911, and he was using skateboards by the time he was five. So check that out, guys. Um, but I was lucky enough to meet every one of these guys, but the first guy I met um, after the Octavex where as I'm driving down the street, I said, I don't know if this, this, this red bungalow is going to cut it with me. And I find a guy who has literally filled all of Ashland Avenues with these <coughs> wonderful little, sort of his version of folk art, with you know, just sort of boats and swimmers and lighthouses, and all in one very, um, very um, uh, congested, lovable scene. And um, I said, OK, I'm hooked. And that kind of got me going for the next um, you know, period. Uh, I came to the vertical files here, the first place I looked um, at the Pratt, which I owe a tremendous debt to. And let me tell you this, there was nothing. There was article after article clipped and placed in the files so delicately um, in which I could go back to the 1920s. And I could, in I did in fact learn that screens existed probably before Mr. Octavec started in 1913, but no evidence, no physical evidence. So finding any physical evidence, like the ones I found in Cooperstown, was pretty remarkable. And how many of you saw the exhibition that we just closed at the Maryland Institute College of Art? Pretty exciting um, finds, especially um, with the 19th century materials. One as early as 1835 from Sweden. Um, but I not only did the search, you know, um, engage me, um, probably because 
every visit to Baltimore, every time home, and ultimately moving here in 1983, back here in 1983 to write a doctoral dissertation on the subject. You know, it was just filled with visits to screen painters, and um, and ultimately it became filled with you know funerals of screen painters. And um, today, of the um, perhaps dozen original artists that I met, only two are surviving. Uh, D. Herget and Tom Lipka, and still are active um, and painting. And some of you may remember in the 80s we did the film, and it's kind of funny. We did the film, The Screen Painters. Why? Because I didn't think I wrote books. I thought I, people tell their own stories. I, I'm a documentarian. It's what I do. Um, but once, I guess, um, this trail was cold, um, it was time to put it down in this book forever. And I'll tell you, the beauty of Painted Screens is it was all secrets. You know, one by one, the painters would tell me how they had gone to the Octavex store at 2409 uh, East Monument Street, and they would all go in, you know, under the pretext of buying paints or in some way learning the, the you know, the source from the source, and nobody could, nobody learned anything. It was all secrets. And so, um, when the artists started getting together, when I came to back to Baltimore and I started bringing them together, and what I realized was. I knew each of them, but they didn't know each other. And they would say to me, you know, you know uh, Albert Octavik? You know Dee Hergen? You know Johnny Eck? And I said, yeah, you want to meet him? So we literally uh, brought together a, a guild of screen painters. And the, sc the stories came out, the secrets came out. They started sharing with each other. And I think part of the joy of writing this tome is that there are no more secrets anymore. And what I am really excited about is allowing this to go forward, knowing that it's for the next generation to write what happens next. When I was going through the streets of Baltimore starting in the 70s, I will tell you, there probably were 75, 100,000 screens on the windows and doors. Every window, basement, first floor, second floor, third floor if you had one, alley side, basement all the way up. Remember, the kitchen is where the action, the basement is where the action was in the Baltimore Row House. That's where your kitchen was. That was the great room. That was the family room. So you had to have privacy there as well. Uh, so at the heyday, the 50s, the 60s, the 40s, 200,000 screens. There were hundreds, if not a thousand screen painters out on the street. Everybody could be, was one. Why? I'm not going to pay Octavec 50 cents. That's why the guy who inspired me to go past the Red Bungalow, a gentleman named Frank Deomes, and oh, why we should write books and why we should put on exhibitions periodically, because when the trail is lost, when you lose these people, we can't, they're gone, you cannot find a connection despite the wonders of the internet, they somehow troop in. They, they end up at the show. They walked in and they said, I am Frank Deomes' grandson, and it was like, Oh my God, you know, it can live and we can inspire these people. So what's interesting is today, um, painted screens live, but they are not your grandmother's painted screens any longer. Uh, the red bungalow, maybe, and who's gonna pay, who's gonna get the red bungalow? Somebody who really has a yearning for the past, whose mother, whose grandmother had it and they really are thinking about it. But for the most part, this is your painted screen today. Monica Brewer, actually, who lives in Highland Town, is one of the few screen painters left living in the city. She took an apprenticeship through the Maryland State Arts Council with John Octavec, the grandson of William Octavec, the founder, and added this to her mashup art. She's never going to be painting the traditional style. And I think the beauty is that the screens are starting to appear in all different forms. You know, we're seeing them as bracelets on cuffs. We're seeing them on fly swatters, anything um, that's, um, that's wire mesh. And the subjects are anything but the painted, the, uh, the red bungalow. So let me just say one thing, the demise may be about aesthetics. It may, in fact, be about changing tastes. But one thing that happens, when neighborhoods change, we say, oh yeah, Canton's not Canton anymore because all the elderly widows who were there when I lived there have passed. Um, what happens when you buy a new house? The very first thing you do, if it's a row house in East Baltimore, the very first thing is to take off the form stone. The second thing you do is change the windows. The moment you change those windows, screens are gone. 
And if you value them, if you appreciate them, those screens may be saved. For the most part, they ended up in dumpsters throughout the alleys of Canton, and I wasn't watching the backs of the houses at the time. So, um, and if you go through East Baltimore today, it's nothing but new windows. So it's kind of a, a really interesting sign. So I say it's time to start anew. It's time to paint your own screens. Buy the video, How to Paint a Baltimore Screen, which the Paint a Screen Society, which grew out of our little guild, um, you know, has available. Take a workshop, keep it alive, read the book. What I love is, I don't know if you know it, but um, the New York Times put this on, our, on their, their Christmas gift list this year, mm -hmm. um, Holiday Gift Gives, and we were like astounded um, that it was discovered by Eve Kahn, and she said, I just I couldn't get over it. And, um, I had put out an email immediately that said, buy this book, New York Times says. And everyone says, well, we already bought it. And I said, then read this book. I invite you to do that. Thank you.